and welcome to Man's Model Moments. Today I will take you through the full build of the newly released Airfix 148 scale Westland Sea King. The highs, the lows, and the ultimate conclusion of what this kit is like. Now I won't be going through the kit's contents, instructions and so on, as I've covered all of that already in my unboxing video, linked above if you've not seen that one. As with that video, let me say up front that Airfix provided the kit as a review sample, though I've not received any payment from them, and I'm under no obligation to say anything nice. So let's get straight into it, shall we? Construction starts with the interior, and specifically the main cockpit bulkhead, first by attaching some small items, and then by cementing this to the main internal floor. Next up is the prominent and now famous relief tube, which is visible from the open access door. It's a little fiddly, but no real problem. We then cement that to the other side of the bulkhead wall. and then this assembly goes into the main floor and the prior cockpit bulkhead. This is a very snug fit, demonstrating the precision of Airfix's production in this model. The entrance step also goes in at this point. We then move on to assembly of the various seats in the kit, the number of which depend on the variant. The seats in the rear also follow the same pattern as the cockpit seats, so I won't replicate them here. The seat consists of six parts, back, two sides, a bottom, rear brace and cushion, and present no issues putting them together, though tweezers will be handy if you've large fingers. The left pilot seat also has this suitcase shaped assembly, which is a simple two parts. And then just attaches to the seat's rear. Steps 11, 14 and 15 have you put all the cockpit controls and seats in, but I left the seats out to paint separately. Adding these now is a bit of a gamble however, since they are very delicate and I did break a couple of the pieces, as we'll see later. We then move on to the main instrument console, which builds up over the course of steps 16 to 21. This follows a simple and logical progression, and the detail Airfix have included here is very impressive. You could certainly go to town painting this all up if you wanted. Decals are supplied as well if you don't want to go that route, which is what I applied after painting. Step 19 has the main flight instrument panel, two of which are provided, depending on the variant, attached to its cowling. The last step here is to join these two assemblies, as I again left these out of the cockpit until after interior painting. Next we tackle the rest of the interior, and here I encountered my first problem. Building the sonar station in steps 26 to 30 was far easier if you start at step 27, then 26, and maybe this was just me, but I found the side went on much more intuitively with the main parts together, and it's the only time I found the otherwise very clear instructions difficult to implement in the parts assembly. There was no difficulty for any of the rest of this station, and it builds up into a lovely little sub-assembly.
The same can be said of the sonar winch operator station, which is next up in steps 31 to 33. And again with the actual sonar dipping probe winch assembly in steps 35 to 43. In fact, it bears saying that the whole of this kit is highly modular, with a lot of separate sub assemblies that you can build and paint up separately and then bring together. I think that's a really strong point of this kit, as it gives a lot of scope for the modeler to build out of sequence, whilst the parts are curing, or drying from being painted, or simply if you get bored with what you're currently working on. What I would do differently were I to build this again, however, would be to paint some of these pieces before assembly. Painting the sonar probe inside its winch assembly was unnecessarily difficult, but that was my fault and not one of the kit. At least I'm making these mistakes so you don't have to. The sonar winch assembly itself is a beautifully rendered thing, and it seems almost a crime that such a wonderful amount of detail is going to be almost entirely hidden in the completed aircraft. Step 44 unites the winch operator station with the completed sonar winch assembly, and we can put that aside for the moment. Step 45 is a simple two-piece assembly that makes a set of shelves in the entrance to the interior. The way Airfix has made the Seeking is to create a self-contained interior as the core of the aircraft, and the outer hull then goes on top of that. This means some alterations are needed depending on build variant, meaning I had to drill a hole and remove some plastic from the port side in step 66. And then attach these overhead lockers in step 67. These inner fuselage areas also have some ejector pin marks which though shallow and are unlikely to be seen, I didn't want to risk leaving only to discover I could see one through an open door. I thus filled them with sprue goo, smoothed them over with my scalpel and sanded when dry. There are also several areas on the outer fuselage that required surgery or filling, such as here. I masked these, filled with sprue goo and trimmed down, but I don't like the concept, and I'll talk more about that later. As you can see, I've skipped out of sequence here, as I wanted to prepare everything I could before starting to paint the interior, and steps 71 and 72 cover the various window areas that need blanking off, again depending on the variant you've chosen to build. These all fit very nicely, and are easily cemented from the rear. Step 75 introduces another of these inset access ports, which is why we needed to perform the surgery on the inner wall previously. Step 87 puts the internal walls to the dipping probe egress port in the lower fuselage, and are ready to get the airbrush out. The interior of the Sea King, like many post-war aircraft, is a rather uninspiring grey. So I started off by giving a coat of medium dark grey to all the internal surfaces and components.
When that was dry, I came back in with a lighter shade and concentrated on the centres of the floor panels to build up some visual interest and depth. I did the same with vertical surfaces, but sprayed from above to artificially create some shadows under any protruding detail. Once that was dry, I repeated all of that with a lighter grey shade still. As the seat cushions have some moulded in contours, I used a heavy, semi-dry brush of heavy body Liquitex White over these, touching up over any overbrushing on the seat. I also used a light grey dry brush in the interior to catch the highlights of the raised rivet detail on the floor. After detail painting on the sub-assemblies, I did the same dry brushing on these as well. For the bright orange seat cushions, I used a contrast type paint made from Liquitex ink, which did require a couple of coats. Back to construction and step 91 for the engine assembly frame. Air intakes next, which again differ depending on the aircraft variant. Steps 75 to 79 all deal with the exhaust assemblies, which go together without any issues and are cleverly engineered to give the correct angle. Back to the interior, and I have put the painted seats into the cockpit after missing them out back in steps 11 and 14. 54 brings in the sonar assembly, which fits nice and snugly and is secured with liquid cement from underneath, preventing messing up of any of the interior painting. I actually then introduced the two sonar operator station chairs in at this point, before bringing in the sonar station itself, since the chairs are more delicate and fiddly to deal with, and the sonar station makes it harder for you to manipulate them if you put it in first. Speaking of the sonar station, the decal for the screen was put on before it was attached. I used the inactive version. Interior assembled, I moved on to the landing pods, the fit of which again demonstrates the precision present in this kit. Much of the assembly of the interior of these is almost push fit, with cement just making the fixture permanent and making the assemblies really easy. When it comes to putting the internal bays in the side pods in steps 105 and 106, they are very positive fits and again, almost lock in place. The port pod has the addition of a light, but the installation of this is painless and easily secures with liquid cement without hazing. I use a liquid chrome pen on the rear of the transparency to represent the reflector. And then the pod halves could be brought together and secured. Steps 109 and 110 add the fronts of the pods and the top fillets. The fronts are simply glued on with no fuss. and the fillets also drop into place, although I did use some silicon grip pegs just to hold these in place whilst the cement dried. The 
the side pylons or simple two-piece assemblies. And they attach into the pod seamlessly and at the correct angle. The landing gear pod struts are also two-piece assemblies, with a small insert required for them at one end, again presenting no issues. Now I did do several live streams on the build of this kit, so some parts of this assembly were not caught on my normal camera. One of these was the assembly of the interior clamshell. This is actually a very simple process, and the only departure from the instructions I took was in securing the starboard wall to the interior first, rather than the port, since the cockpit bulkhead is on that side, whereas the port side has the entrance door. Once that interior assembly is complete, the engine exhaust assembly is placed, but not cemented, on top, and the port outer fuselage half brought in. This allows the exhaust assembly a bit of wiggle room to ensure they align with the outlets in the fuselage correctly. The actual alignment with the outer hull is very positive, and again, it's just a matter of securing it in place with cement. Step 82 adds the additional rear exhaust piece at the back of the rotor housing. After which the starboard fuselage half was added, and once again, the precision of the kit is evident here, as the two halves marry up with no fit issues anywhere, just requiring cement to lock everything together. Step 85 has us add the four lights to the lower nose, with a single piece transparency again allowing for securing with liquid cement without the danger of hazing the clear pieces, which is nice. I once again use my liquid chrome to back these. And here you can see the lower hull with the carved and filled sections here that I'm not keen on, and step 86 brings that nose assembly onto this. That lower hull complete, we bring that onto the rest of the fuselage, and again can secure with liquid cement. I did clamp this assembly, one of the only times I felt I needed to do this in the build. Step 89 should really come immediately after step 83, because this is not an easy part to fit if your fuselage halves are already dry, as you can see from me struggling here. Ideally, you need the flexibility of the newly joined halves to insert this piece, as it's not a simple drop-in. Once you get it, however, it slots in place perfectly. Just be aware and don't leave this step until after everything is dry, or you'll have a harder time of things. In contrast to that, the front of the main rotor body goes on perfectly. Step 93 brings the air intake assembly in, which seemed fine. But at step 94 I found there was a gap, and whilst not being able to see anything I'd done wrong here, I ended up taking off the intake assembly and carving a small piece off it to get the engine panels and front to fit flush. Now again, I don't know if I did something wrong here, but I'd just recommend check fitting all the build steps in this area before cementing anything. In the end, everything fitted together fine, and it wasn't a big issue. All the way back now to step 20, as the painted and decoled instrument console assembly was added to the cockpit.
I mentioned breaking some of these delicate controls earlier, here was where I put them back in place. I propped the control column up with a small piece of tissue just so it didn't droop whilst drying. More surgery now as the rear spine for the HS1 needs a small aerial removing and also this circular piece carving off. Once done however, the actual attachment of this piece, along with the radome seat and cover, are all very straightforward and again, no fitment issue and no filling required. Step 98 brings the upper nose onto the airframe, which instantly gives it a distinctive look. I put the side pods on next, which the instructions helpfully call out should have a prominent gap. Support struts are next, which are also painless. Time to bring in the front side transparencies, and I encountered my first real disappointment with the kit. The left side was fine, but the right hand side of my fuselage was just slightly short shot. Too late to replace it, I just did the normal modelling solution of adding a small piece of plastic and sprue goo, and that tackled all of the transparencies went on without any other problems. Now on discovering the short shot, I actually went on to these other assemblies before coming back to fix the issue, and again, it's one of the great strengths of this kit. Get disheartened, bored, or stuck at one point, and there are plenty of other things to move on to. The tail assembly is a lovely little sub-assembly that is ideal for one of these moments. It has no real vices, building up quickly and flawlessly into a lovely little unit. Step 140 is a good example of that, where you bring these three prior sub-assemblies together and they all just marry up perfectly, despite some complex mating surfaces. As I eventually decided to go with a folded tail, I needed to cut off a small nub here before attaching the folded tail union which is a really clever part. There are separate parts for the folded rotor variant of the rotors, with specifically angled rotor attachment pieces. These have broad, solid attachment points to make sure they're solid enough to support the rotors when attached. You will, however, need your tweezers for steps 178, and the later step 182, where attachment of some of the small linkage pieces comes in. After all of those small pieces, you get a brief reprieve in steps 179 through 181, where the main rotor shaft and the associated star-shaped pieces are all sequentially attached. One hundred and eighty-two sees the tweezers return for these clever but fiddly linkages to complete the main rotor assembly. Step one 
Keep your tweezers handy though for the undercarriage scissor linkages and tie down hoops. I place the undercarriage in the bays to cement them at the right angle, but then remove them for painting. I glued the entrance steps to the door, but I still got them attached to the sprue here for painting. Step 161 has the winch installed in its fairing, which, as you can see, is a really snug fit, and probably didn't even need me to cement it. The rest of the winch assembly cements together with no issues, and was set aside for painting. At this point in the build, I'm into a lot of fiddly bits. Step 154 covers a whole host of these, some of which I'm doing now, before painting, like the filler plates and these flat aerials. You can also see here one of the uglier areas of surgery needed for the HAS-1. This forward aerial pair, this blanking plate, and these two little inserts here. I also attached the pitch adjustment mechanism on the rear rotor for painting. After masking transparencies and interior, I primed the entire model and all the separate assemblies with automotive spray. I then used a dark grey to do some pre-shading, though I didn't go overboard here, just doing the main areas I wanted to. To recreate the rather unusual paint shade used on the HS1, I started with a base of Tamiya Sea Blue misted all over the fuselage. I then mixed in some medium blue to lighten this a little and went back over the airframe. I added a little X4 blue to intensify the blue coloration a little, and sprayed from below to cover the lower surfaces. Adding some more medium blue to this to lighten it a little, I came back in from above to give that same increase in saturation, but with a more faded look to simulate the airframe being faded in the sun. More medium blue was added to lighten and desaturate the upper surfaces a bit more. I then did a final lightening with some white in the mix to boost this effect further. It looks much more pronounced here since much of this will be lost once given its gloss coat. Removing the masking with tweezers on a cotton bud after painting really shows how clear the canopies are. Exhausts were masked off and sprayed aluminium, and then the whole model was given a coat of pledge ready for decaling. The cartograph decals are gorgeous, go on with no issues and look great when dry as always.
I was a little surprised that there were no separate two-piece decals for the danger warnings on the tail fold, but careful cutting of the one-piece ones provided yields good results as you'd expect. The one thing with the decals is that there are a lot of them. I found it really helpful to paint over the numbers of what I'd applied in white paint, and later Tipex when I found my bottle, to easily keep track of where you are with all of them. For the rotor decals, I found it useful to measure and mark their position. I think it's worth the effort to create a consistent, regular look to them. Now my last live stream covers the last elements of finishing off the aircraft, so check that out if you want to see me actually doing these pieces. Suffice to say here though, that adding all the final elements, the windows, doors, landing gear, rotors and so on, were all accomplished with minimal fuss. That said, let's have a look at the finished model. So what do I have to say about the new Westland Sea King? Does it live up to the hype? Well, the engineering and precision of the kit overall is extremely impressive, as is the depth of detail and the finesse of most of the parts. The highly modular nature of the build makes it a very flexible kit in terms of the way you actually approach it, and Airfix provide you with a lot to create a really excellent model out of the box with a host of options and extras. Almost all of the fit throughout the kit is pretty much perfect, with only a couple of areas that I had issues with, which could have both been my mistake causing it, and equally weren't that hard to correct, so hardly actually an issue at all. That being said, there are a few things I am a little puzzled by. I think having to carve off parts of the external fuselage, rather than provide a base piece with the parts to add on top, is my main one, because I can't really see a logical reason why this was done on the parts that require it. Given the number of excess or optional parts Airfix already give you, half a dozen or so additional bits would hardly make a difference, yet I think it would make the build easier and more enjoyable. Similarly, the lack of a two-part decal for the tail fold hardly seems worth mentioning and does feel like splitting hairs, but it's just noticeable because Airfix have thought of almost everything else, so when something isn't there it draws more attention to it. Again, it's not an issue, it's just odd considering all the rest of the thought put into the kit, like provision of off or on decals for the radar screen, for example. Lastly, my short shot. I almost don't want to mention it, but the fact that we as reviewers got standard production line kits means I have to. I've said it before, but Airfix really need to get a grip on their Indian QC, because it's letting down the fantastic work that everyone else does. It wasn't a big thing, and it was simple to fix, but it's an unnecessary fly in the ointment that simply shouldn't happen. It happened on the Bond bug, it's happened on other kits, and it creates an image of Airfix which I don't think represents the values that its UK team deserve. Overall, however, these are minor niggles on a kit that I used zero filler on any joints or seams, that oozed quality and class from each centimetre of styrene, and built up to be a model that, even as someone who still doesn't really like helicopters, I'm pretty pleased with. Now one thing I didn't do here was any weathering, because that's not really anything to do with the kit build, so I'll probably return in a separate video to go about weathering and detailing this model. Let me know in the comments if that's something you'd be interested in seeing. 
that's all for this instalment of Man's Model Moments. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel for more like it, and share this video with others you think would also enjoy it. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, and if you're feeling generous then I also have a Patreon, which is absolutely the best way of helping me to grow the channel and produce more content like this. With that, I hope you have plenty of modelling moments of your own, and I look forward to welcoming you on the next video.